and people who aren't ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, and the one small child in the corner, uh, we're just about to come on to the last talk of this evening, first night of the weird weekend. Just a couple of little announcements. Most importantly, is Judith in here yet? Well, she's out back. Can somebody summon Judith? I wanted to wave to the boys and girls. Uh, I'm just going to introduce you to Judith Jaffar, who is, and I always pronounce her name wrong, I think it's Jaffa or something. It's something <laughs> weird pronunciation. And I, it's something like Jaffa Cakes, you know. Um, Judith is the chairperson, chairman, chairwoman, whatever, of Before, the British UFO Research Association. And she's going to be running an information stall all day tomorrow and Sunday. And sometime tomorrow she's going to be coming up to talk about the organisation and what it does. And hopefully she'll be taking some new members. However, if you're going to join any organisation this weekend, you're only going to join one join ours. But once you've joined that, if you're not already members, then you're welcome to join before, because before is a pretty fab for our groovy organisation, and I'm their PR officer. Hurrah! And, and before I actually finance quite a lot of the work that we're doing, so they're pretty groovy people. There are books and magazines for, for sale from us. And we are also taking some new membership for the Centre for Fortean Zoology. This weekend we're doing it on a cheap basis. If somebody wants to join, they get five issues of the magazine instead of four. The magazines are discounted from £2.50 to two quid. The books are discounted from £14.99 and twelve fifty to a tenner, and from seven fifty to a fiver. We sold quite a lot, and I'm actually in this wonderful position at the moment. I feel a bit like the bloke who came up on, a st on stage at Woodstock and said, Dudes, we're now a free festival. Well, we're not a free festival, we've now broken even. And for the first time ever, we've actually broken even on the Friday, after the Friday evening instead of halfway through the Sunday. Hurrah! Thank you very much, David, for those hearty hurrahs. Has Judith arrived? Did you say yeah. Judith, will you wave to the boys and girls so everybody knows who you are? You! <laughs> That's her. The lovely Miss Jafar. Jafar? Jafar? Jaffa. Jaffa. How the hell do you pronounce a Lebanese name in a Scottish accent? That's just too much. <laughs> it's very well. Of course, I do everything very well, my dear. That's why you pay me such an awful lot of money. I do very well because you're Scottish, not you. <laughs> oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh, so as well as the ta as well as the taff and the paddies, we've now got a bloody. What, what do you call uh, We've now got a bloody jock around. Right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to pass you over to Richard, who is going to introduce Matthew in his own inimitable style. Our next guest is doubly disgusting in that they're an illegal immigrant and a single parent. They've slithered over into England to take advantage of our benefit system. <laughs> he's come over here with his smelly cooking and his revolting religion and his heathen practices and they breed like rabbits as well. There goes the neighbourhood. It makes me want to vomit. The one and only Matthew Williams. <laughs> Page down, page up. Those two keys there. Page down goes to the next slide. Page up goes to the back one. So that's the next one. Thank you for letting me have a pee. Thanks. Well, oh yes. There's no need to do this now. There we go. And Do you want to switch the follows part off? That's the problem when you have the guy that's doing the lights and the AV after giving a talk. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one. So, it, 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 it,
technical difficulties there. Um, well, I don't know what the hell I was being described as because I was, I was literally, I had to have a quick pee because I, I, I was putting all the slides together at the last minute and, uh, but it sounded very colourful, I'm going to find out, no doubt. I had the, the camera on record, but thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm, oh God, I never wanted to be a colourful character, honestly. I, I was quite happy being a behind-the-scenes UFO researcher and I, I got myself into trouble with, with crop circles. Although, I wouldn't say trouble so much, but uh, some of you may remember the, uh, the, the quite um, uh, notorious arrest that I, uh, I experienced. I got arrested for making a crop circle to demonstrate a point to a particular professor, and um, this backfired. Um, I uh, sort of was too, too trusting gave some information away to some people and they didn't hold the information to themselves and got the police involved and criminal records and uh, house searches later. Um, here I am. But I must say that uh, I do believe in crop circles. I do believe that the, uh, the magic of crop circles is, uh, is made partially by people being involved and uh, I think that all this talk is about Redlow Manor and uh, that was my previous um, incarnation as a UFO researcher, which I'm still doing actually, I'm still doing UFO research on the side. But my, um, my belief in crop circles is that uh, the magic of crop circles is that people go out and make them and uh, that strange things manifest in these crop circles. And I've been working with psychologists and scientists to try and actually put a, put a finger on this because um, I think there is some scientific work that can be done to prove this. And uh, you'll watch this space, watch this space. I mean, uh, there's a lot of people out there who'll tell you that I'm a government agent and this sort of stuff. And uh, his spoon. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Indeed. I mean, you know, I I always say to people, I'm a, I'm an open book, really. I mean, most people who know me well know that um, you know I, I don't I don't have a government bank account. Um, yes, well, I may be paid on certain occasions by the government, but... Uh, <laughs> every, every other Thursday? Every other Thursday. <laughs> yeah, but um, generally, you know, I'm, I'm just a sort of uh, normal person who sp spends his time editing videos um, of late, and uh, my, my sort of uh, crop circle interest in the summer months, you know, sees me speaking to television companies from all over the world and this sort of stuff, but uh, prior to this I was a UFO investigator. I got involved in the subject because of um, a sighting I had back in 1991 when I was driving across a mountain in South Wales uh, to do some video editing work, which is a passion of mine, video editing. Um, I was off across the top of the mountain and I saw this triangular shaped UFO thing, you know, I can't say UFO um, in the strictest sense of an alien craft, you know, or something like that, you know, some people interpret it that way. I mean, stricter sense, a UFO, an unidentified flying object, triangular, shimmering, very odd, and it just really took me from being a very sceptical person, who did have some books on the paranormal, and um, I was interested in all this stuff, but I was kind of thinking, yeah, you know, where are people coming from on this, you know, and what, what's, this, what's the real deal, you know, and and sort of reading them but putting it to one side afterwards to suddenly drive across the mountain and being confronted with something that blew my mind. Now, it blew my mind so much I think that I blew a fuse for five days because I didn't actually remember that I'd seen this thing. Which, when the memory came back to me, five days later that I'd actually seen it, I couldn't believe that, you know, I could actually not realise for five days that I'd seen this thing. And this adds to the, 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 sort of the real um, question in my mind of what the hell was that? You know, this is what got me into the subject. This was my initial experience and I couldn't explain it. I went back to the location, I looked for answers, I spoke to people, I became a UFO investigator and I was always looking for the, the best evidence, looking for the, the way to sort of get really inside um, the subject and find out if only for myself, maybe not always to prove for everybody else, but just for myself, what was the truth? Were people telling the truth? Were they seeing these things? Were they really alien piloted craft? Or were they just strange things that couldn't be explained? And, you know, I'm not even sure that I didn't even hallucinate it, you know, but I don't, I still don't know to, the day, to this day what that was. But what I do know is that it sparked in me an interest. And that interest 
took me on to things that I must say I find myself quite, you know, flabbergasted at the things I've experienced over the years. I was a very close-minded person. I became a very open-minded person, but with a sceptical attitude. Not somebody that just believes everything, that will take you know, everybody on face value, but somebody that will listen, analyse, investigate. And if necessary, I will talk to people about sometimes what is um, what people don't want to hear. And certainly the crop circle subjects is, well, the crop circle is sort of that, get the word done. The crop circle subject for me, although it is magical, and I found that there is something valid to it, it has become a sore subject for many that I'm talking about the fact that these things are on the larger part human made. Um, my investigations into Redlow Manor, if you press the page down on that, um, it's just got my name. Oh, oh. that's where you do. Oh, gee. This is a pro user. <laughs> this is the this is the chairwoman of before the chair lady of before and she knows how to use a computer. Okay, if you press the next one, thanks very much. Now this little hole in the hill, um, UFO investigations. As I said, I was I was desperate to find out more. I needed to speak to people. I needed to find out UFO cases, investigate them. I was reading books on the subject after I became a convert from being a skeptic, you know, not believing in these things, to suddenly having an experience which blew my mind and made me think, there must be something more going on, I must find out, you know, people aren't lying about their experiences, I've had one, you know, so maybe other people are having these things, what does it all mean? I read a book by Timothy Good called Above Top Secret, and I still think to this day it's one of the best books out there on the UFO subject. Um, one of my other favourite books I would say is Perspectives by John Spencer, who's actually been the chairperson of Bufora. Very good book, well worth a read. But Timothy Good, um, I had a lot of respect for him. I, I liked his work, I liked his, his angle, it wasn't just uh, pie-in-the-sky stories and weird sort of channeled alien information which can never be proven. He was interested in the military angle. What are the military doing? Are they investigating UFOs? What would they be doing investigating UFOs? Have they come to any conclusions about UFOs? That's what I was interested in, his work on government research. And he'd spoken to a number of people who were insiders, uh, working in the MOD, current staff working there, ex-staff who would usually say a little bit more now they've left the job and maybe their security clearances had slackened off a bit, they would talk more about their um, involvement. And also, um, the anonymous sources, the anonymous sources who would tell people things that couldn't be credited in the books because they would probably blow their security cover or um, get into trouble for this. But these anonymous sources are related to Timothy Good in this book that there was a secret department called DI-55 working for the Ministry of Defence. Now, if anybody, any of you who don't know what DI-55 is, it stands for Defence Intelligence 55. Now, we've also got military intelligence now, MI5, MI6, similar sort of thing. It used to be called DI-55 in the 1950s. It's changed to MI now. So, DI-55, this is one of many departments, obviously, you can tell. You know, it's going up the ladder of um, specialization. And MI5 deals with internal security for the country. MI6 is foreign security. James Bond sort of department that Ian Fleming wrote about, um, MI6. But DI-55, this department that had never been heard about or talked about officially, was supposedly, according to the anonymous sources in the MOD, the department that investigated UFOs. And they were based in Whitehall, and they were supposed to send out people to investigate the subject um, in person, interviewing witnesses, gathering the information back, and presenting this back up the line to intelligence committees, and also the, uh, the, sort of the prime minister at one level, and maybe even the shadow government that we hear about beyond it. This was all alleged to in the book. But alleged to, you know, and it's very frustrating when you read a book and you kind of think, well, these are all the sources, you know, they could 
They can tell you all sorts of things, these anonymous sources. Is it real? Does it really exist? You know, do these people um, work in DI-55? Would they come forward one day? Would they be released from their security oaths to talk about this stuff? And I kind of pondered about this, and uh, I thought, well, I'd love to do something. I'd love to, like, break into the MOD, you know, building, pose as an officer, you know, get in this under some sort of false pretense and get in there. You know, it's kind of like a little fantasy sort of idea, you know, I wonder what's behind their door and their filing cabinets and their X-Files, you know, I wonder what, what's in there. Um, but the, re you know, the, the actuality of it is, I mean, it's probably a highly secure place, you know, I wouldn't get in there, you know, be caught and be in a lot of trouble. But at the same time, he mentioned this place called RAF Redlow Manor, which was another place rumoured to be investigating UFOs. <coughs> now, the rumour was about RAF Redlow Manor that they were sending out officers to interview witnesses. They were actually field officers going out. Now, when Timothy Good heard this, he decided to investigate and go in on foot to find out what Redlow Manor was all about, just to see the general outline of the, the base. I mean, everybody knows the MOD in London, or a lot of people know the MOD in London, the actual buildings, the scope of it. There's a lot that people don't know, unmarked buildings and things like this, but the general MOD, where it is, and everybody knows about this, but RAF Rundlow Manor was not very well known. So he decided to go down and just check it out, take a camera, have a little wander around, you know, see what this base was. And he found out that it was a very low-key base. There wasn't too much there. It was um, quite a small looking base, a lot of porter cabins, and uh, it didn't seem to be incredibly secured. You know, he was wandering around the fences, and although there were signs saying, you know, keep out, guard dogs, this sort of thing, you know, there was nobody about. It just looked like quite a little base. And I agree, that is exactly what Redlow Manor looks like. My investigations, as I'll come to in a, in a minute, reveal a whole different story that wasn't covered in Timothy Good's book about Top Secret. Now, when he finished having a wander around the base, he booked himself in, I believe, to the Rudlow Manor Hotel. And for anybody who doesn't know, Rudlow Manor itself, it's a manor house building which is actually owned by the MOD, or looked after by the MOD. Um, they don't do anything in it, it's just a manor house building which is kept um, as a listed building. And they have a lot of buildings around the outside which they use. Um, I'll come to a little bit more about what, what they do in those buildings in a minute. But it's the headquarters to the Provost and Security Service, the actual manor itself. Um, it's not a very large building, you know, it's not like some manors you see, but um, it's actually inside the MOD base. But he went back to stay in the Rudlow Manor Hotel, which is not part of the same facility. So if you read the book, it's actually a different place. But when he booked in and uh, booked himself in, went to his room, it wasn't too long before he had a knock on the door and he was in t interrogated by people who said they were working for the Ministry of Defence and wanted to know why he was in the area. To cut a long story short, he was actually taken out from the building, from the, from the hotel, taken away and questioned at some length inside some part of the military facility. And this was quite disturbing to him. He thought, well, what, you know, this has never happened to me before. I've been investigating UFO cases and hanging around military bases, but I've never had this sort of treatment. And they knew where I was. You know, they knew I was in the hotel. They knew. And subsequently, his investigations followed that he realized that when he went back to the base, because he did go back, that, that he was being watched, that there were secretly people hanging around in the bushes and camouflaged people wandering around. And I can confirm this, this is, this is true that the base itself does actually look like a very low-key facility. The manor house itself isn't used, but the porter cabins around it are, but they're just small porter cabins. And it kind of looks run down. It doesn't look like you could get many people in there working. And it's in the middle of the Wiltshire countryside. It's pretty nondescript. It's, even though it's RAF Rudlow Manor, it's not an actual RAF airfield. There's no... Um, landing sites apart from a helicopter pad in the area. So its function is administration, administration facilities for the MOD. Now this is about as far as Timothy Good's investigation went, but after reading this I thought, well, hey, you know, 
This sounds exciting. Secret base out in the middle of the countryside. You've got guys hanging around in the bushes watching you, and you know, if you hang around and keep an eye out, you might get sort of picked up by them. This sounds like a bit of fun. Let's go and see whether it's true. You know, let's go and validate his story. Let's also have a little bit of fun and see whether these guys are there hanging around outside the base. So me and my friend decided to go down there. And we drove up to the main gate of the base. We were looking at the sign. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you before I go on, because I'm going to lose this slide otherwise. This is the Box Hill Tunnel. If you go from Bath or Bristol to London, you go through this tunnel. It was created by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who was a very clever engineer. There's probably a lot of you familiar with the name. And um, he created this tunnel, which was revolutionary in its time. It goes for a couple of miles through the hill, and it points uphill, and apparently on the date of his birthday, the sun shines straight down through the tunnel. This is what it's famous for. But um, what a lot of people don't realize is that on the other end of the tunnel, this is the, the side that everybody sees because it's from the road, on the other end of the tunnel is a set of railway tracks which can be switched and trains that either come from that direction or come from this direction and stop. In the wartime, they were directed into tunnels. And these tunnels um, are on the other side and come back into the, this hill. I'm going to come to this because this is my, where my investigation veers very much off from Timothy Goods and uh, goes a little bit further. What's interesting here is you can actually see the level, which is why I want to show you this before I get rid of the slide. You can see the level of the, the, the trees at the top and then there's a field slanting down and you've got this tunnel area here. Now, this shows you um, that on this level, at the other end, trains coming in to the hill, which is a wartime um, MOD munitions dump, which is very secret during the war, but a lot of people in the local area know about it, would be on this level. Now, my investigations into some of the stuff I'm going to talk about now place an underground facility in the middle sandwich between the railway tunnel there and the upper portion. So just to give you an idea, because it's a good level shot of a hill going up. Should we have the next slide? Thanks. Right, so as I was saying, we came to the base, my, me and my friend Paul, and we drove up and we had a little look. Sorry about the slides not being that good, but this does actually say RAF Riblow Manor. Um, MOD facility, keep out. Um, but we're on a main road here, and we're just looking at some gates. Um, it's not really fences, it's just gates. And the gates drive you up the, um, it's towards the guardhouse. Now, we decided that we would drive up the road to see, you know, the extent of where the, the, the base started. So we drove up the road, and we were just looking, turned around, and we came to come back out. And this was the very first time we'd actually had a look at the base. So we're just driving up to see where this base was. And as far as we were concerned, we hadn't crossed any military checkpoints or lines. We were just coming up to the guardhouse and, oh, right, okay, we don't want to go any further, we'll turn around and go back. But no sooner as we were turning the car around than a white um, Ford, what's the name of it, not the escort van, they're the bigger ones, the uh, transits, uh, yeah, the new tra type transit vans. Um, was coming down the road towards us, I and mean, he's going a bit fast, you know, for sort of coming down this road. And when he got close to us, screeched his brakes on, fully locked his brakes, and then the van skidded sideways in front of us, came to a lurching halt, doors on the van opened, and a bunch of guys came out, well, not guys, but army, RAF, whatever, dressed in fatigues, camouflage, jumped out with guns, ran towards the car, pointing the guns at the car. And me and my friend were just like, okay, right. And strangely enough, I mean, if you can picture this, a guy, an RAF officer, came goose-stepping, literally, like as if he was, you know, part of Hitler, Hitler Youth or something, you know, came goose-stepping towards the car, stopped, leaned down, looked into the window, I wound the window down and he asked us what we were doing there. And we explained that we were sort of UFO interested researchers. We'd heard about the book in Timothy Good's, um, heard about the base in Timothy Good's book. And we wanted to find out what was going on. And I was working for Customs and Excise at the time and he actually said to me he wasn't happy with my explanation. And 
I said, well, you know, I've got credentials. I'm not just a, a lunatic. Look, here's my, here's my ID card. And I gave him that. He went away. And uh, he came back and sort of with a stern look, he said, well, okay, you can go on your way. I was like, okay. But this was after a little while. And, and during this time, we still had the people pointing guns at us. We were just like, well, hang on a second. Me and my friend, we'd done a lot of looking around military bases ourselves. We'd kind of been interested in, you know, what the military might be flying out of these places. You know, we're sort of like aircraft spotters. And we would go to military bases to the hammer and the fences and what's going on in there, you know, interested. But we'd never had this sort of activity. And for what we could see was actually, as described in the book, quite a low-key facility. So I thought to myself, after this had happened, I thought, well, what's going on here? What, what the, what's the deal? Because this doesn't look like a very big MOD facility. It hasn't got an airfield. What gives? Why? You know, why do we get these people come up? It's pretty much as Tim Good said. These guys, you know, they came out of nowhere. They knew we were there. Bang, they were on us. I thought, and I was thinking about it. I was thinking, I can't explain this. But then a new thought started to take over, which was, I don't care about explaining it. I'm actually pissed off at this because I don't like having guns pointed at me. And we were on the public side of the road, surely. You know, what the hell's going on? We're not in Northern Ireland. We're not terrorists. What's going on? This is a low-key facility. So I started to think to myself, well, I'm going to find out what's going on here because something's going on here to make them want to behave like this. This is more than we'd ever experienced at any other facility. Something must be going on. Now, my investigations didn't have to go very far. I spoke to the local people, which I suggest to you is always a very good technique. If you're ever wanting to find out something about a UFO case or a military base or something strange, just speak to the locals, you know. Just go in, chat to the people that you find in the town. You know, people who walk down the street, just politely ask questions, and it's surprising the answers you'll get. But I didn't have to look far, because by the afternoon um, of the same day, I think I'd had enough information to sort of piece together now why we were dealing with a very important facility that on the surface looks like nothing. Our Air Force Low Manor is in fact an underground facility. On the surface, it's just a couple of buildings and it looks low-key and it's meant to look low-key. Underground, it was during the wartime as per the uh, previous uh, photo showing you the train track going through the hill, a very secret facility for storage of um, TNT um, weaponry for the Ministry of Defence. It was a very safe store of weapons because no matter how much bombing you had on the ground, you had 120 feet of solid stone. Well, not as solid as granite, but um, bath stone. But still, you know, this was an absorbent stone that would take the, take the pummeling of any amount of um, bombing. So it was a very safe store. And the MOD had decided, after um, much consideration of facilities to store weaponry in, they were having terrible trouble with um, storing weapons. They were storing them in forests, they were storing them to tarpaulings. This is in World, World War One, World War Two, And they were trying to keep these things secret where people wouldn't know where they were, the word would get out, and they would have to keep on moving the ordnance around. And they said, we need a facility that's going to be safe, secure, and nobody's going to know where it is. It's not going to be penetratable. And after much deliberation, they found an old set of quarry tunnels, which were dug out for the bath stone. That's the stone in the area. It fully penetrates the um, uh, sort of Swindon Fault all the way down to Bath. This stone was taken out to make the city of Bath. Now, the Roman city of Bath used bath stone. They still use bath stone there today. And the only place you can quarry bath stone is out of these tunnels. It's officially has to be that type of stone. So it comes out of the area. It can't be shipped in from abroad. It has to be bath stone. So because of this, the whole area had been riddled with tunnels, you know, sort of hundreds of years. And people have been working in very squalid conditions and digging out stone, creating these little catacomb tunnels going across the countryside, coming out all over the place. And the MOD said, well, this soft stone, bath stone, is easy to cut. If we take the existing tunnels and we shoe them up, prop them up with 
bits of, bits of metal you know, to you know, concrete them in, we can very quickly chisel our way through and create the tunnel space we need to store the weaponry. And within a short space of time, they'd actually created these facilities. It was, with, it was an engineering feat. It cost, it cost hundreds of millions of pounds, which was in the time of the First and Second World War, it was a lot of money, you know, it was, a, it was an unheard of amount of money, but it was secretly budgeted. And this was something that the locals were all involved in because they all had to work underground in some capacity. And it was a well-kept secret, everyone kept this secret locally. But now, later on, as I say, I spoke to the locals and this is an old secret now, you know, it was 40, 50 years ago. They created these tunnels to store all the weapons and it was immense, but now it had all finished and Nothing was going on there. However, the facilities which are kept at Rudlow Manor, should we try going on a slide? I can probably sort of de demonstrate some stuff then. Thanks. Yeah, here we are. This is Rudlow Manor site one. This bit you can see here is the actual manor house itself. And around it, you've got some porter cabin buildings and some temporary porter cabin buildings up here. This was where we actually came in, somewhere at the top. And uh, we were driving along the, the, the fence line, and that's where we got the guns pointed at us. Um, this is a public road down here, just as that's a public road up there. And uh, you can actually look at the base. These are the gates here. I think we might come to these in a second. These gates face straight up into the, the manor house, and it's a public road. So should we go on a slide? Um, yes. There we are. That's the main gates for a low manor. And another one. Thanks. Right, I've done myself a little map. I used to produce a magazine and I put this map in the magazine that I used to do. This was in 1995 when we checked it out. Um, I managed to ascertain the extents of the underground facilities from speaking to the locals. And I put together an idea in square, square meter, square mile terms of where I thought the tunnels were going to go underground and which rough areas they were going to cover. Speaking to some people, we knew that there were bits that we could actually access as well to get in near to where the military tunnels were underground before they would be blocked off by metal grills and this sort of stuff. But working out the rough squared area underground, I approximated it at the time and I was one of the first researchers that I know of to, to be talking about the size of this facility and I estimated it to be about 25 miles of underground tunnels and a lot of people who were kind of, you know, where's all this coming from Matt, you know, I mean how can you prove this? And they were a bit sceptical about this because it was an unknown story outside of Bath, outside of Caution. But as I say, you didn't have to go very far, you just speak to the locals and they would tell you the stories. But people outside, they're going, well, this is impossible. We couldn't just not know about this. This is crazy. And we're, well, that's what secrecy is about. You know, the locals knew about it. They kept their secrets. And now after the war, there's no point to be telling the world because there's nothing there. But there is. The MOD converted all these tunnels and used them during the war. When the um, functionality of storing uh, TNT was no longer required and the Cold War came in, and the threat of nuclear weapons was more present. Nuclear weapons being far more powerful than TNT, you don't need to store so much TNT because if you get your Third World War, you're going to use weapons which can be stored probably in the back, back of a caravan that probably destroy half the face of the earth. But, um, you know, these l large areas, which I estimated to be 25 miles around the tunnels, were now redundant. So the MOD came along and said, hey, why don't we do something with this? Why don't we convert this now into a Cold War bunker? Now, this became secretly funded again, the headquarters for command and control of an emergency. After a nuclear war, the royal family, prime minister, government, and select officials, civil servants, and also, um, that's term for uh, arseholes. Arseholes, that's it. The arseholes would go underground. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Didn't know how to say it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, a lot of arseholes go underground and survive a nuclear war. 
And the stories I heard were just amazing that they had hospitals down there, which I suppose not so amazing, but cinemas, pubs. And you say, well, what do you mean by pubs? You know, just, you know, just like a little hole in the wall with a couple of taps. They say, no, 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 you know, huge cavernous areas where you can see right up, you know, and, and you're sort of looking all around and then you've got roads and, you know, these roads intersect each other and they've got road markings and pavements and, like, you know, you can't be serious. And yeah, the stories kept on coming out, you know. Cinemas, pubs, hospital facilities, creches, everything. Every, every civil service department was represented. Gamma were down there. The Queen was going to live down there. It was done out to the max. This was supposed to be a very comfortable place for the elite to survive after a nuclear emergency or some other type of emergency. So this was all underground here. Now, in looking around the area, we found a lot of air breathing holes. We were able to prove this, um, showing that dug holes going into the ground were actually still active. You could feel warm air being pumped out of some, and you could feel air being sucked into others. So these were obviously being processed underground, and you had some sort of extraction and uh, sort of air breathing system still in operation. The MOD's official position on these facilities were that they were disused. The stories about them being a command and control facility, a Cold War bunker for the royal family, were always denied. Yet, s slowly and surely, in, after the 60s, when um, Duncan Campbell and uh, other writers were looking into sort of Cold War issues, what would happen in a state of emergency, it was coming out that there was a secret bunker they named it Burlington. It had a few of the other, other names like Hawthorne. But this place was kind of secret. You couldn't really find out too much about it. Well, this was it. This was the place that everyone was going to go. This was the big one. And subsequently, it has actually been now confirmed. I just happened to hit the nail on the head, 25, most known for own figure, but I was pretty lucky. Um, it's actually been confirmed now by a naval commander who's in charge of some of the parts of the facilities. He says, we've got 25 miles of underground tunnels here. Now, I'm going to curve this background to UFOs in a minute because you're probably wondering well, what's all this sort of, you know, to do with UFOs. At the moment, it's just a thrill-seeking exercise to find out what's going on, you know, what's underground, why are they here, where are the Cold War bunkers. But it does actually have a relation to UFOs. And strangely enough, I found out from the locals as well that some of them said that this base was connected with UFO investigations. And there were rumours about this. Rumours, third-hand rumours, the similar sort of rumours you got in Timothy Good's book, but rumours nonetheless, and persistent rumours. Rumours also of a train track that went all the way from Ludlow Manor underground to London, but just rumours. So where was the truth in some of this stuff? Well, I've never found anything that says there is really a, a train track that goes from Redlow Manor to London. I have found proof, as we'll go on to see now. Do you want to try the next slide? We'll see if we get to some of the um, factual information. Um, just before we do that, then, I'll show you some of the bunker entrances. Now, this just happens to be, I didn't know it at the time, this is on a main road, so you drive past it and you think, well, you know, this is just a, uh, a little sort of mound in the ground and it doesn't look that big. But this is actually an entranceway to an elevator uh, system where large amounts of people can get down underground just by being on elevators. It's very similar to being in the London Underground. It's designed to take a large amount of people down quickly. And this is the bit that actually leads into the highly sensitive royal family section of the underground bunker. And you can see it from a main road, so you just wouldn't know it, it was any different to anywhere else. So if we go to the next slide. And that's the same, uh, same actual thing, but from the side angle as you drive past, you get a different angle on it. So the next one. Thanks. I'll skip through these quite quickly. Nearby, although I think it's closed down now, this thing that should say here, Caution Underground Centre, and um, they used to take people on tours um, of the quarry sites, that were the original quarries before being converted to the MOD, the bits that were left over, and they would take people down and show them um, some of the stuff that uh, used to go on with the uh, manual labour conditions 
And uh, there was also an aircraft factory um, connected to this facility underground. I could have remembered, I think it's Hawker Sibley. Could be wrong there, but I think it was an underground aircraft factory where they built parts um, here. And um, anyway, you can go, you can pay a couple of quid, go underground, they'd show you around, but they wouldn't really talk about their military facilities. They'd be warned not to talk about it to the public. But if you really press them, they would kind of admit that there were things around that, you know, a lot of people don't want you to know about. Uh, it just turns out that this facility here actually to, um, doubles as an exit facility for one of the most important command and control facilities still used today. It's called the Command and Defence Communications Network. Should we go to the next slide? It's probably there, actually. Um, that's me going in to some of the old quarries. Um, you can get into some bits. You have to crawl in uh, initially. And then it opens out underground and you can get into large tunnel areas where you can walk around. Very muddy, very humid, um, but you can, you can literally be losing yourself in there for 18 hours at a time. Uh, time flies very quickly when you're in there. You've got to have a compass, you've got to have a map, um, or somebody who knows what they're, they're doing, because there are all sorts of signs painted on the walls to confuse you. Exit, 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 and they're all to dead ends. So which is the real exit? And actually, none of them are the real exit. You have to know that the other signs, you know, you've, you've got to have a map which tells you how to get out, basically. And a compass is useful underground for that. And for goodness sake, don't go messing around um, going into these things unless you've spoken to somebody who knows a little bit about caving, because it is dangerous, but it's also good fun, you know. But if you, you need to speak to somebody about caving before you attempt to go into these places. <coughs> okay, should we go to the next slide? Okay, that's my friend Paul, near one of the air breathers going underground. Next slide. Now, talking about the secret security police that hang around the base, um, you get these people who walk dogs. Now, dog walking is not normally, you know, it's a police activity, but in the MOD, where they want to play, play down the, um, uh, the, the sort of importance of secret surveillance, they dress people in normal civilian clothing. But the reason you clock the fact that there's something else going on is because you see a lot of the people there wearing the same clothing. So if you hang around for enough time, you start to spot that they're all wearing the same green wellies, the same sort of waxproof jacket, you know, and some of these guys or ladies will have keys to let themselves into the facility. So although they're wandering around the countryside, when they finish wandering around the countryside, they go back inside. So obviously, you know, these people are keeping a check on the, the facility. There are also unmarked cars, which have picked us up on numbers of numerous occasions. And these guys are sharp. They really are sharp. So we're the next slide. This rather innocent looking building with a bit of mud around here, I mean, you wouldn't, you know, you could maybe say that's about 150, 200 foot across. It's not that deep a building, but these bits here are just metal grills. And it just looks like some sort of power station, some sort of transformer station. Well, this is actually an entranceway with a lift shaft and a stairway to the underground facility called the Command and Defence Communications Network. Now, all these facilities are dotted very close to each other. You've got Redlow Manor, Site 1, with the Manor building, Redlow Manor, Site 2, Command and Defence Communications Network, Basil Hill Barracks, um, the Caution Computer Centre, which is a very interesting facility I'll talk about now, all of these are inside barbed wire, but they have main roads that run through them, but the barbed wire doesn't let you get into the bases. The only one of which doesn't have any security around it is the Caution Computer Centre. And so remember that Caution Computer Centre, CCC, come back to that. But this is the command of the Defence Communications Network. To give you an idea how important this is, my research has now let, um, uncovered the full scope. They not only communicate um, with satellites from this facility. They um, operate all of the Skynet satellites which are used for encrypted data traffic. They do some secret surveillance using these satellites. Now Britain apparently doesn't have spy satellites. But these satellites that the British MOD operate as communication satellites do double up in a number of other functions that they, um, they perform. One of which, it turns out, happens to be UFO surveillance surveillance of rather large electromagnetic fields, which happen to come from nuclear explosions. But, as we know, some people talk about UFOs having electromagnetic propulsion systems. It was relayed to me by somebody 
who was disconnected with the UFO community and their you know stories, myth, folklore. That Skynet used to do this. It subsequently follows out that I've actually had extra confirmation from people who worked there that this was the case. So I'm rather confident now that Skynet is probably one day going to come up in the government document files as being having tracked UFOs. Now they they're based here underground in a in a hardened protected facility. And they have investigated UFOs because they get all the data traffic coming through from all over the world encrypted. They get to see the reports of what's going on where first. Now, RAF Redlow Manor is the headquarters, or was the headquarters, of the Provost and Security Services. They're the RAF police. They investigate any wrongdoings at the MOD, um, RAF rather. They would also send out their own staff to investigate um, low flying complaints, either from unknowns, which could be UFOs, or from pilots in the MOD. So they'd be sending these um, RF police out to check out whether or not their pilots were flying too low and causing people's windows to break, this sort of thing. But they would also have a function to send them out to investigate UFO sightings by witnesses. Now, DIA 55, which we've got documents coming out which we'll talk about this used to employ the RAF police to go out and investigate these cases on their behalf. Should we go on to the next slide? we will skip through. How much time have we got? Because I'm... How much? 15? 15, okay, we better go quick. Cologne Air Base. This is a disused air base nearby. As I said, RAF at Le Mans doesn't have an airfield, but this disused air base is one of the best maintained air bases I've ever seen for a disused air base, and it's always constantly been ma maintained. You can walk onto the runway without having to even cross a fence. They have a very large array of satellite dishes, but they're way down the road from, from Redlow Manor, so you wouldn't think they would have any connection. But of course they do underground, the cables run, and the command of the Defence Communications Network has got to have its satellite dishes somewhere to communicate up to space, and this is the facility. So when they talk about a disused facility, this does have a barracks, but this is a very much operational secret facility. And if there was an emergency, the runway is there, you special people are going to come in, land, go into the bunkers as quickly as possible. Next slide. Um, this is the facility from the air. I've actually hired an aircraft and flew around this area. You've got to be a bit careful not to sort of go into the exclusion zone because it is you know, the Redlow Manor is part of line and control zone, which is an active airfield. Um, so you've got to be careful not to go into that. But we managed to get these zoom photos from a distance. That's Cologne Air Base. These are the satellite dishes, which are for the Command and Defence Communications Network. Next slide. Right, Chris Fowler, interested in Timothy Good's book as well, wrote to the MOD and finally got a response in 1995, which, as I said, in 1995 was when we were going down and when we had the, um, the initial experiences, he wrote to um, the MOD saying, well, what does our effort Le Manor do um, with interest to UFOs? And they actually admitted down here in paragraph three, your letter mentions the role of our effort at Le Manor. But Le Manor is the headquarters of RF police, which does serve as a focal point amongst other things for flying complaints. And in the past, Red Low Manor was indeed the RAF coordination point for reports of unexplained aerial sightings. However, once received, they were simply forwarded to Secretary of Air Staff 2, Nick Pope. If you're familiar with the name Nick Pope, he used to investigate, so to say, um, UFO reports um, for the MOD, but he was just part of a very much bigger network. Um, anyway, simply forwarded to Secretary of Air Staff 2 for appropriate action. Nowadays, Redlow Manor, along with other RAF stations, forward such reports directly to this office. I can confirm that RAF Redlow Manor does not carry out any research into UFOs or any related matter. We're going to go on to the next slide. Yes. Right. This is an investigation report which turned up in the MOD and detailed, we had a number of them. They appeared out of the blue and they related to departments we'd never heard of in the MOD. And we were absolutely bobs back when we saw this because for a long time, the MOD would deny that there were high-level investigations going on. They would say that the Secretary of Air Staff, just a couple of staff, would be investigating these things. And they would send out letters to the members of the public saying, oh, it was probably just a balloon and just a, don't worry and all this sort of stuff. And they were the, the public face. 
Nick Pope and his predecessors. Now, his predecessors, who are no longer tied up by official secrets, have said that there were people above them working at much higher levels investigating this subject. Nick Pope's still working for the MOD, he's not allowed to say that, because he would be breaking his official secrets act oath. And I've actually managed to corner him through questions that he can't answer into basically saying, yeah, I would write the letters to members of the public, but I was sending the stuff upstairs to be investigated, and they send me their conclusions or file stuff. He would lose his, he would lose his pension, Matthew. He would lose his pension, yeah. <laughs> his beer money. <laughs> Indeed. But DDI Tech, top right hand corner, Department of Defence Intelligence Technical. Now, these are listed as a department that investigated a UFO sighting, which was a very fast flying object which exceeded, you know, normal parameters of any aircraft um, capabilities. Now, DDI Tech, in this report, with a lot number of other documents, they were investigating the UFO subject. Now, they're a high-level department. Can we go to the next slide? And, and we have other documents as well in this file. Secret. So, when Nick Pope and others tell you that this subject is not taken seriously, this is a secret document. Some are top secret, some are restricted. These are all dealt with internally as matters that the public are not to be made aware of. Now, okay, there has to be certain military secrecy, but at the end of the day, it takes 30 to 50 years, sometimes 100 years, for these documents to come out. And now that this document, this file came out relating to all these other departments, now we've got um, a distribution list on this one, which relates to other departments. We've got signals departments involved. Um, we've got the metropolitan and southern sectors, which, if you actually follow back, becomes Rudlow Manor. We're involved, so these things can just whisk past you when you're looking through these documents in the Public Records Office in London. You can read these things and you just go, oh, well, you know, Southern Sector. But you have to know the military play this game of always changing their names. So one day they called the MOD, the next day they called the DOD, the next day they called the DDFD, you know. And if you're 30, 50 years down the line and you don't know what DDFD or DS means, you don't know that they're actually those guys who connect to those guys. So you have to know and look back through the files, learn a little bit of the history to realise that what we're dealing with is these same departments. It all focuses in on certain areas. We have the next slide. I'm skipping across these. You can, you can actually look at some of these in more detail if you want on, on my website. These are featured in, in the magazine. Um, so it says up here at the top, a procedure for investigation of UFO reports. I'm skipping a bit, but it basically says, reports from civilians received by units should be acknowledged formally in writing and copies of the reports themselves forwarded directly to the Air Ministry DDI Tech. Now that is above Nick Pope. So that was the history. That's how they used to do it. Do they still do it like that? Apparently so. It will be appreciated that public attach more concern by Royal Air Force personnel um, to the, than to other members of the public. So it's essential that information should be examined at the Air Ministry and the police should be controlled officially. And all reports are therefore to be classified confidential. The personnel to be warned that they're not to communicate with anyone other than officials regarding information about the phenomena. So there's your cover up because conclusions are made, the public are not told. Radar detection of unusual targets is to be reported by stations through the normal channels. They should make special reports of any unusual responses, i.e. responses uh, moving at ground speed exceeding 700 knots and at any heights above 60,000 feet. Well, in 1956, anything that's traveling at 60,000 feet or above is stuff that they don't have because they don't fly that high back then. So they're interested in stuff that technically nobody's got or shouldn't have. They weren't even in space then, you know. And this stuff, 60,000 feet and above, that's the ceiling. That's the ceiling of the atmosphere. You can see the curve of the Earth. You're basically on the edge, you know. And they're interested in this stuff. So, and when unusual responses are seen, NCOs should be informed, checks should be made, um, necessary records listed below. Basically, 
stamped up instructions from HQ Southern Sector, Red Blow Man. So another document that came out that was just mind-blowing. So, okay, next slide. Okay, Air Ministry Operations Center. I'm going to skip a little bit quicker because I've probably got, what, five minutes? Five minutes, okay. I'm going to rush now. Air Ministry Operations Center. So this is the headquarters dealing with, you know, sort of, if any emergencies happen, these are the guys who go, emergency, scramble the planes, oh dear, World War Three. Air Ministry's Operations Center. You know, these guys are in charge of the, the, the MOD, which is, after all, you know, along with the United States, one of the most powerful um, military machines in the world. Now, they, this is their standard operating procedure for reports of unidentified flying objects. And they say, well, it's blanked out here for some reason. It's something they don't want us to know, even in this document. But the reports of unidentified flying objects rest with S6, which is connected with DL-55, and Air Intelligence Technical 5B. So we're seeing lots and lots of departments that we haven't heard about before. And this document was so mind-blowing that when we started talking about it, we immediately, when we saw it, we knew we, we, this was just like a bombshell. You know, having looked at many boring documents that don't mean anything, suddenly we had something that named a load of departments. So we immediately asked for copies, took them out. The MOD removed this file, which is actually illegal. And, of course, if the file isn't there officially, and we start saying, hey, we've seen the information which proves that these departments dealt with stuff, but the file isn't there, well, we look stupid because the file isn't there. So they made sure the file wasn't there. We had to ask parliamentary questions, and we got Yaya Wynne Jones to ask her a question. It's all very embarrassing. There was a big cover-up about it, but within two days of the parliamentary question being asked, which was about a year and a half after the file had gone missing, the file came back. The reason that we think the file was taken was because somebody made a boo-boo on releasing this information because it was going too far. It was putting the pieces of the jigsaw together. And when we started telling people just how much the pieces were coming together, they said, pull the file. But that's illegal. When a file's been released to the Public Records Office, it's a matter of public record. You can't remove it. And they tried to. And they got caught with a pants down. We caught them so much with their pants down, we actually managed to prove that the file was with the MOD when they said it was lost and they knew where it was the whole time and we got the head of the MOD file department to admit that his own department was lying and he as a librarian was not happy to know that that file was booked in and they were saying it was lost because he as a librarian said that's not the way it's meant to be done and good, good on him because it helped prove that there are people who don't want you to know about these things so, there is a cover-up on the UFO subject. Anyway, we'll skip to the next slide. Thanks. Um, okay, Air Ministry Operations Center. We start to get names of people we can look up as well, people who are investigating this stuff. Next slide. Okay, we have these names. Air Ministry Operations Center, DDI Tech, Defense Intelligence 55, which follows up what Nick Pope, uh, smart Nick Pope, Timothy Good said in his book. So, we proved through finding the files, what he had only managed to have from anonymous sources, we were able to prove it. So, in fact, I'm gonna, I just realized, this is meant to be like that, so that uh, that camera can see. But, um, anyway, um, Air Intelligence 5A, Provost of Security Services at Royal Air Fred Lowe Manor. All these departments implicated. So, in addition to the underground facilities, in addition to the command and control center, which is there underground, they were investigating the UFO subject. And when Chris Fowler, you may remember the <coughs> very first document we looked at, he had an admission to this. This document appeared, strangely enough. So the MOD had changed their position and was suddenly prepared to say that Red Manor had an involvement. This file appears and then gets pulled back. So something was going on. We don't quite know what, what was going on, but somebody somewhere was trying to get information out to the public, probably, in some manner. So the next slide. Okay, this is us going in underground, some of the um, quarry bits. We've gone up to the edge of the military facilities. Next slide. This is some of the bits that they put in to stop you moving around underground. It doesn't really stop us, you push them out of the way. Next slide. Um, just a little jokey thing. You know, people seem to sort of do a lot of graffiti underground, and there seems to be a lot of alien faces down there for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, um, just there's a lot of alien faces down there. It's a strange thing. Okay, next slide. 
And there's another one, just uh, yeah. here again. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is an aerial photo from Rudlow Man from the air. These are lift shafts. Now you can't see them from the ground because they don't look like much from the ground. When you fly over them, you can see these vehicles over here, you could drive a vehicle or a van in there and take it underground. They've got roads down there, as I said. They've got roads you can drive, you've got pubs, you've got hospitals. You've got, it's a huge thing, it's 25 miles of underground tunnels. This is an air breather. Next slide. We managed to get into a facility called Monks Park, which is supposedly disused. It's not really not disused. What it is, the military sold it to, them, to a friend of theirs, which then hides their operations because it's now privately owned, you see. And recently, this privately owned facility has now gone back into MOD um, use. So it kind of shows that, you know, you've got to be careful when people tell you that things are shut down and being sold off. <laughs> because they sell them to themselves and their friends to cover the, uh, to cover the tracks. Is that, is that district? Sorry? Is that certain district? Uh, district 619, G9, G12, G13. District 12, 13. Could be, uh, we managed to get in this place and it was full of um, army surplus stuff. Leafield Engineering, who've just actually got a contract for developing uh, a type of missile. Or was it, no, was it? No, it was, I think it was a missile. It used to be uh, developing other stuff for the Navy. But anyway, we're gonna, you're going to kick me off, are you? No, you can carry on a little bit longer. Okay, okay, I'm going to... Come on then, let's slide. Yes, Rick, Richard Conway and me, we got in there, we got shot at on the way out. They denied this. They said that it was just a fireworks party nearby. And Matthew, I very nearly had a great surprise for you. Okay. If it hadn't, I got another gig, had to go to the north. The guy who usually does uh, AV was the RAF guard. who was on duty that night. He wasn't one of the ones who shot at you. He was in the same guard, the guard, guard squadron, or whatever you call them, as the people who shot at you. And I was going to do this wonderful, this is your life sort of thing, and bring up the guy who shot at you and just see what happened. This is interesting. But this is the man who almost killed you. Do I yeah. but, really between the walls? <laughs> no, he's a good bloke, Phil, except for the fact that he blew out the chance to do the weird weekend because he went up to some rock festival somewhere. But he's a good bloke. Okay. And I just thought it would be mildly amusing to bring up the guy who was in the guard that actually shot at you. Sadly, that didn't happen. Well, we, said, we said we were shot at, and they denied it, but we, uh, we, we knew we were shot at. Uh, and I think we can confirm that. <coughs> there we are. It's got a first, you got a UFO first. Well, something actually happened. Well, I don't know, you've got a UFO first in confirmation, you know, that's, uh, as opposed to a denial, perhaps, but uh, no doubt he'll disappear now in the middle of the night. He did, last Tuesday. <laughs> anyway, this but the only disappeared up to Leeds. Oh, right, he's at, he's at his pop conference, oh, yes. Well, well, we'll have a chat with him then, if you don't mind. Oh, no, degenerate young people and their popular music. Shut up, Delzy. Right. <laughs> this is just some of the yeah, other underground facilities. You can see the roadways that you could drive down. Um, Next one. Roadways again. They seem to sort of, they go left, right, left, right, left, right. It seems to be that maybe when they were soaring TNT, if it explodes, it deflects the blast. So they, the roads always go left, right, left, right, left, right. It seems the most obvious explanation anyway. But uh, next slide. And again. And these are just the empty bits. Now, Monks Park is way off the edge of the map, so that's a slightly different facility. This is the Command and Defence Communications Network. Had a few cars parked there. You know, you can see it's just a small building, it's just lift shafts sticking down underground. It all looks very low-key, it's very small, but it's very important. Next spot. Uh, aerials nearby, but not on <coughs> the actual bits that do the, the work. Next slide. Um, there's the CDCN. Uh, Caution Computer Centre, we're going to see in a second, right up there. So, another facility, secretly funded by Margaret Thatcher as a command and control centre. And they don't have any fences around it to stop you going in. And they don't have any signs saying it's an MOD base. And there's nothing to stop you going in, right down into the ground, and then up to the grills, and suddenly you have people surround you and go, what are you doing here? And you go, well... I don't know, they say I couldn't come in. And they go, well, you can't come in, it's an MOD base. And so we didn't say it was an MOD base. <laughs> well, um, it is, so get out, and you can't come back. But actually, you can go in because they really do try to play this facility down. 
because the bases nearby have the big signs, the fences, and they do have guys with guns on the gates. But this place, the CCC, up in this corner up here, is literally a, um, a car park with no fences around it. There's nothing to say it's no money facility, and it's a bunker going into the ground. It's just brilliant. It's a great bit of fun to go in there and, and get chucked out. So, uh, yes? I'm assuming you've been to the Corman's Arms. Yes. And you've been down at Pops. Yes, just... that photo of me climbing in was at um, Eastgate. And you've been down um, all the way to the keypad system in Box system. We've been all the way up to the cameras and, and the actual military okay. bits of the ground. And Moncton Farley, you've been down there as well? Yeah, Moncton Farley, which is now privately owned by... Um, well, the District 12 is not owned privately. You can send it on to District 14, it's owned by the security camp company. That's right, yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been in there, it's been explained to me which bits are still. Do you know a guy called Lowe's Hoover? Doesn't ring any bells. Right, too hard. Do you want to have a chat with me? I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying, but I mean, if you've got something... Well, they, don't, they don't ring any bells. You can buy the detailed maps. Um, That's right, you can buy the maps to get in underground, you know. It'll show you if you've got a compass how to get around. You need those if you're going to attempt it, yeah. Yeah. The quarry was always a great place to go if you're interested in the quarry bits, but uh, yeah, it's good beer. Nice view as well. You better, better get on because I'm, I'm pushing on the time here. Sorry, I don't want to no, sorry. Well, Thank you, thanks. Would we have a chat in a bit? Yeah, thanks, mate. Okay, so we'll step on quicker then. Thanks. Okay, this is the entrance way, as I say. You know, there's nothing to stop you walking straight in down a little sort of bushy alleyway, and then you suddenly come on this thing going down into the ground, and inside this security um, booths, you know, that rotate so that you you um, you can't get through if you haven't got the right passcodes and things. Okay, next slide. And then when you get chucked out, you, know, you get you get the guys who say you can't come back. But this is the extent of, of actually what is there stopping you going in. That's the entrance way. You've already come right up to this point with nothing stopping you. And the only thing saying kind of stop is a yellow sign with an exclamation mark in it. Nothing it's saying MOD base. Just an exclamation mark, which can be interpreted in many ways. So, next slide. Okay, um, next slide. Um, next slide. I'll just skip on now again. These are just aerial shots. This is um, lift shafts near Monks Park, still operational. Next slide. <coughs> um, Port and Down is an underground facility where they test um, chemical warfare and things like this. Um, all very secret underground facility. I just thought I'd show you a photo of the entrance way to that because it's another in, uh, interesting facility that happens to be underground. Next slide. Um, some of the equipment you'll need to go down the ground, hard hats, lights, um, if you want to go, and the very same mat from the Quarryman's Arms, laminated for you so that when you get muddy you can wipe it off. <laughs> it's very muddy down there. Don't use aerosol cans to mop your way. No, <laughs> well it's been done hundreds of times isn't it? and uh, you just get lost, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and don't try stringing them or bits of rice, you'll just get lost. Okay. Now, somebody tried going in there with, um, some kids went in there with uh, matches. It lasted about five minutes until the matches ran out and they were in there for 20 odd hours. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, but they found them, but you know, obviously it's, uh, it's very easy to get lost down there. Um, next slide. Air breather out of the facility. Next slide. Some of us going down on a, on a little mission. There's the quarryman's arms. Next slide. That's underground. Next slide. Um, strange things like this, actually. You find that people have taken the time to build. Uh, yeah, these are soldiers. They've got the pyramid, Stonehenge down there, all sorts of stuff that people have taken the time. You know, obviously, MOD people or, or quarry people bored. Yeah. I mean, you're wandering along in the dark and suddenly you come across these things, you know, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Next slide. Um, this is where we got stopped by the guards with the guns, and that's what started my whole interest in, into this facility. I have documented some of this in magazines, TV programs, books by Nick Redfern, <laughs> sadly can't be here. Very good researcher, Nick Redfern, and, and he's featured some of the stuff on Redlow Manor. Next slide. And this is the facility, oh, we can't really see it from the hill um, below it. Next, <coughs> next slide. Next slide. Um, these fire action cards of the CCC, 
if you crack open the um, this little thing here, if you crack it open, there are cards that say, you know, fire operation procedures for underground facility. Now, they'll tell you there's no underground facility there, but if you crack open the fire action cards, it says underground facility. You know, this is how you get in, this is what the fire service is supposed to do. Ring this number, blah, blah, blah. So, anyway, um, next slide, sorry. And that's a bit of a facility. Next slide. Uh, the main gates again. Next slide. Uh, from the air, but oh, the awful photo, sorry. Next slide. Um, that's again. Next slide. Next slide. Say what? Next slide, next slide, next slide. See how fast we go, ready? Go, 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 Guys, uh, That's a way to finish your talk quick, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> slide, 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 slide. Thank you very much. Okay. Questions, David? Yes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Manor. Have you looked at see what the um, watch people come and go and see what the staff confidence is? Um, yeah, I mean, there's always cars there. They come and go. But the thing is, a lot of people live in the area um, around it in facilities which are actually owned by the MOD. And it mingles in with people who sort of like civilians, but there's a high amount of population which is MOD, and they can just literally walk the distance it takes. So you don't always see that the, there's cars there. And sometimes people are bust in. Um, some people work underground, and you can actually travel underground in this large area. So somebody might pop up one area and come out, and you know, so you can travel up distances underground. So. <laughs> You, know, you can't always get an accurate um, idea of the complement that are there. Of course, in Pluto Centre, you sometimes uh, see when there's emergencies, like if the Iraq war is on, there's a, the, the, the car park, which doesn't have any fences around it, it's just behind a few houses, it's just completely open, will be full. Yeah. But um, nothing to say that it's an MOD base, but just a full car park, and a lot of people working underground waiting for World War Three. So, is that answer your question? Thank you. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? Sir, David. Yeah, we've got a glimpse of guys from Subtronica Britannica. Do Indeed. Uh, uh, Subtronica Britannica, a very good bunch of people. Um, they, they often have to be <coughs> careful. They don't feature sensitive, current facilities. They deal with old facilities that are no longer a threat if they talk about them. But I think they do this because if they play that line of, well, we're not going to expose your best secrets, MOD. From time to time, the MOD go, well, thanks very much, boys. We'll let you in to see the real facilities, but just keep not telling people about them. And they do actually allow them in to see a few of the facilities. I've heard stories. It does, but because there is an area that is disused, the MOD always makes a feature of that saying, that's disused. And of course it is disused, but everything around it is actually functional and still operational. So it's really easy to say, you know, the RF Red Lumana doesn't have underground facilities that are in use anymore, but Basel Hill does, okay, of course, Rudis and the CDC and those, all those facilities that are around it, so they just kind of get, you know, they get you off the track by using uh, clever, clever speech, so. Anybody else? Question. Yeah, one of the slides you've shown of you go on the ground, the lights seem to be on. Yeah, the lights are on, they leave the lights on um, permanently. And even in the underground bits that are not in use, there's a maintenance um, sort of thing. Money is provided by the government to keep this place um, ready to be used if necessary. It's, some bits are empty, but they could easily be, you know, sort of filled with food, filled with people very quickly. But um, they're kept on a, what they call a care and maintenance basis. Um, and, you know, the lights are always on. Yeah. I mean, I've been to other bunkers, actually, where the power is on in different parts of the country. It just seems to be that when the MOD or government leave a place like that, they actually leave the phone lines active, the power active, and the doors open, strangely enough. So you can walk into a lot of these bunkers that are deactivated, and uh, the power is still on. So these bits that we got into that um, you know, we get managed to get photos of, yeah, that some of them were active and being used, but some of the deactivated ones, the lights were still on. So, yeah. Mr. Curtis. Off you. 
when you went to this underground pub there, what was like the, the big, what was like the biggest thing of Friday brain? You know, when you were about um, like underground like uh, pubs and things like that, did you actually see that with your eye? And this is the thing because we've actually penetrated underground some places that you're not supposed to be able to get to. Um, well, like, what have you actually seen see with your own eyes? Well, I haven't seen, nor anybody I've ever met has seen the um, underground pubs bit. Yeah. But it is so well known about and talked about that I believe it to be then. It is actually there. Yeah. There's a bit that we get to when, we, when we've penetrated a certain section, there's a bit that people know about, and was eventually, because so many people had mentioned it and been there and kind of managed to get to it, eventually they put it on Channel 4 News and they said, well, here we are standing in the bunker, you know, that may be used for a Cold War emergency, what and behind say? us, they say, is the doors that go to the bit that everyone would like to see but can't, and that's the bit we can't get to. What you see with your own eyes, Martin? A lot of empty tunnels with... Um, well, like massive tunnels? Yes, with roads, roads yeah. and um, every once in a while you'd have a stairway, an elevator shaft, an emergency escape, um, escape things, um, maps on the walls of how to get out, and immense storage facilities, basically. It's, yeah. it's very large. You could lose yourself down there. You really can get lost. Very easily. Very easily. Yeah. And it's... 25 miles of underground tunnels. Well, no one knows about it. Lots of people know about it, but strangely <laughs> enough, the information start to dissipate down as you move away from Bath. But if you go into the town, if you go into Bath or Corsham, I guarantee you, well, I, can't, I won't bet money on it, but I'll, get, I'll pretty much say, if you go into Corsham or Bath and you just walk up to anyone in the street and say, what do you know about the facility? You'll get a different story every time, but they'll probably say, well, my dad worked down there, my granddad helped build it, and, and it's weird, because, you know, it's like that, 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 and you get all stories, but you go to London, you know, nobody knows about it. It's kind of like... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I tell you what, Matt, it's the only thing. I am always sceptical about the thing of uh, UFOs, uh, <coughs> 14 researchers, having surveillance and government cameras and those. But do you remember what happened in Las Vegas? Matthew and I went to Las Vegas last November, and we met Nick Redfern in the bar, he was waiting for us at the bar at some Vegas airport. Mm -hmm. We came out, and queuing up, waiting to go on the shuttle to the hotel, was a very dapper middle-aged man in a white suit. Who said that he he gave his address of living in Caracas in Venezuela? He was a really nice guy, and I spent the weekend chatting happily to him, as did Matthew, as did Nick. It was only three months afterwards we found out his name wasn't on the guest list. He'd booked into the hotel under a false name. And if that guy wasn't the head of station for the CIA somewhere in South America, and the fact that he'd come, he'd met us straight off the plane, knew who we were. We just thought it was somebody in the 14 universe who followed us. But he'd given a false name, he'd given a false address. And then we suddenly realised all the weekend, all through the conference, he'd been in the, he'd, he even got himself invited to the organisers' cocktail party. He was everywhere we went. And he was asking you, me and Nick, some very, very strange questions. And now, I think it's not paranoia. For some reason, I believe that the British and American governments are seriously interested in the stuff that we do. Yeah. And it's bloody scary. Because just like somebody said, just because they say you're paranoid doesn't mean that they're not that computers. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Williams, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Are we going to let Taffy Pop plug his Circle Makers video? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> plug the Circle Makers. Circle Makers video, if you want to find out what the Circle Makers are really up to, and you want to hear it straight from the horse's mouth, and you don't want any bullshit, I've done a three hour documentary speaking to the Circle Makers. Myself, and many others. And I think you'd be surprised to see the wide spectrum of people who are involved in this. Some of which are even Christian people who think that they should really be doing it because they think it's maybe even communing with the devil. <laughs> but 
and it's great pains with themselves. There's a lot of interesting stories in there. I've got copies here, I've got two copies on VHS, and I've got some DVDs. It's a dual DVD, I don't know, a tenor, or, 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 or broke me down. I think that's value for money, but anyway, thank you. That's all I've got for sale. I, I, I'm going to do a Riddler Manor video eventually, but uh, I haven't got one with, with me today. I'm going to get around to doing that and show you some of the footage that's never been seen from underground. So, thanks very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's about it for tonight. Um, doors open at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, and the first speaker here, oh, it's some, it's some weirdo from the University of Southampton. Southampton. It's Darren May starting off tomorrow. Uh, as you'll see, there have been some changes to the programme. Darren's actually given you two talks. And the one I'm particularly looking forward to is the one he's given on Sunday about Mystery Wales. And that's not the place where Matthew comes from. <laughs> However, it's open, doors open tomorrow at 11. Uh, the first speaker is Darren on at 1 o'clock. And every